Hello, I'm Robert Moots. I'm Professor of Rheumatology and Consultant Rheumatologist working in Liverpool, UK. There are many different names for Betcher's disease. Some people call it a disease, some people call it a syndrome. I tend to just call it Betcher's because that's much more simple. And that's a very rare disease in the United Kingdom. It's much more prevalent in other countries, particularly the old Silk Road countries from Japan through China, the Middle East into Southern Europe. And it's a condition where people can be troubled by many different symptoms. It can be problems from anywhere, down from the brain to the big toe. But most typically, people complain of ulcers, uh, mouth ulcers and ulcers in other places. People with Betchett's can have very many different types of symptoms. The most frequent symptoms are ulcers in the mouth and unfortunately genital ulcers. Now it's very important to know that these are not caused by infection. Betchett's is not caused by infection. But after those, probably the most frequent symptoms can be eye problems, it can be skin problems, and then much more rarely there can be problems related to involvement of the brain and spinal cord, thankfully very, very unusual, and also vascular betchets where people can get thromboses, aneurysms, bleeds. Again, thankfully, these are very unusual. The person that can work out what causes betchets will get a Nobel Prize, because the simple answer is we just don't know. What we do know is that there's a balance between genes and environment. So there are some genes, of course, we inherit those from our parents that can increase the risk of Betcher's syndrome, Betcher's disease, or just Betcher's. And although we know those genes, we know there's not a very close association between having them and getting the disease. A lot of healthy, normal people walk around with those genes and never have any problems. In fact, the majority don't have any problems. But some people, for reasons that we don't understand, can have Betchett's triggered. And although we don't know what triggers it, not specifically what triggers it, we seem to feel that this is some sort of microorganism, some sort of infection that we've not yet characterised. So the cause of Betchett's is a combination of the genes on one hand and of the environment on the other hand. And again, we don't yet know the full details, the person that does will become very, very important and famous. If we don't really know what causes Betchett's, it's good news that we're actually better at knowing what to do to treat it. And the strategy that I take and the national centres in the UK for Betchett's uh, take is that we try and use the lowest dose of the safest drug for the shortest time. Now, many people with Betchett's just need some treatment when they're having a flare because it's a disease that comes and goes for many people, flares at some time and then being perfectly fine at other times. So we tend to start off with simple treatments. It could be a mouthwash, it could be a steroid cream, or if the problem is getting a little bit more severe, tablets. And again, we work up from uh, more gentle tablets that can help control the disease through to much more powerful immunosuppressants. And these days we use a lot of the designer biologic drugs. And these have really revolutionized the treatments of Betchett's. These are very effective drugs. They can work really well. And we've got many years experience of them. So we're very confident in their safety. So the good news is plenty of options for treatment and try and find things that are the safest and the best and work for the simplest up to the more complicated. It would be great if we had a special test to diagnose Betchett's, but unfortunately we don't. So the diagnosis is what we call a clinical diagnosis. It depends a lot about the symptoms that patients have. It depends a lot about the features that we find when we examine them. And importantly, in order to make the diagnosis, we have to rule out other conditions. So it's important for somebody who's an expert in Betchett's that understands the disease to be able to speak to the patient, learn what's been going on, see what's going on, particularly importantly, have a look at the ulcers that develop and the other features that develop 
And then on top of that, do a lot of tests just to make sure there aren't other conditions going on. So that makes life a little complicated. But for me, the crucial thing is a doctor thinking about the diagnosis. It's easy for me. I see hundreds of people with Betchett's. The clever thing is the doctor or the clinician who first sees somebody, thinks about that diagnosis and then can refer the patient on. It would be great if Betchett's was curable. It isn't. But on the other hand, in the right hands, it can be really well controlled. And that's really important. It may be some patients have a very mild form of the disease and therefore don't need much treatment at all. Well, that's fine. Many people have disease that's really unacceptable and therefore needs to be treated. Long term treatment, sometimes in short bursts with long gaps, sometimes in chronic doses of drugs can work extremely well. And it's the balance between finding medicines that work well and making sure that those medicines don't cause side effects. That's the crucial thing. We can usually, pretty well most of the time, almost always, find that combination. On the other hand, if we understand more, when we understand more about the cause of it, we can develop targeted treatments that will work even better. And here in Liverpool, we're, we're, we're leading a whole range of uh, trials designed to actually look at the optimal drug. We're also doing work to try and understand what causes the disease. But finally, one thing I must say is that this disease can get better even without our help, because in many situations and in many countries where this disease is much more frequent, it tends to be a disease of young people. And as time goes by and as people get older, the actual severity of the disease can actually drop down. Now, that's really good news. I don't want you to be all aging quickly, but I just want you to know that if you have this, it's not necessarily a life sentence that's going to commit you to a very bad disease for the rest of your life. That's not what we tend to see. Good news.